again this week from my den here at my home because in Dallas County, we're on lockdown. Uh, they've, uh, they, they've got us staying in our homes uh, in light of this great challenge that we're facing today. But again, the Word of God is not limited by buildings or physical facilities. And so it's my honor to be with you again today to encourage you and to challenge you and to not let this virus own you. Uh, there was a man one day, he was terribly worried because life had crushed him and he just wanted to throw in the towel. They called the police to, to kind of try to get him to not quit on life. And the policeman said, look, I'm going to tell you my worries. You tell me your worries. And if my worries are worse than your worries, then you need to reconsider what you are thinking about doing. So they both of them extreme, exchanged their fears and concerns and worries. And after they did, the policeman reached out his hand. The gentleman put his hand in the policeman's hand. And guess what? They both jumped. Because <laughs> uh, worry and fear has a way of transferring very quickly from you to other people. And I think that's what's happening with this virus. In fact, the virus is not the only thing that transfers quickly. Our anxiety, worry, and fear is outpacing the problem of the virus because it's consumed the mind, the heart, the energy, and the emotions of ourselves, our families, the whole nation, and even the world. I want to tell you two words right now. Don't worry. Uh, maybe you didn't hear me. Don't worry. In case you missed it, don't worry. Now, lest you think that comes from me, let me make a correction. That comes from Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, Jesus says three times, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. He says, stop worrying in verse 25, 31, and 34. Stop it. Now you say, but how practical is that given all that we're facing, the unknowns, the crisis, the expansion, the speed, the sickness? Is that a practical expectation of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, yes, it is because he commands us not to do it. But maybe some definitions will help us here. We have a legitimate right for legitimate concern. What we don't have the right to do is worry. Because what worry is, is concern gone haywire. God does not expect us not to deal in reality. If you're sick, you're sick. If you're struggling, you're struggling. But that's different than worry. Concern you own. Worry owns you. When worry tells you, you're not going to sleep right now, I'm going to keep you up. Okay. That's not concern, that's worry. When concern tells you, uh, we're going to palpitate your heart right now and you can't get it calmed down, oh, you've now graduated to worry. When, when you are... Uh, when you're shaking and shivering and sweating because the concern is telling you how you're going to operate now physically, you've gone from concern to worry because you're no longer in control of it. It is now in control of you. And Jesus says, stop it. One man said, I'll pay somebody a hundred thousand dollars who will do my worrying for me. I've got so many things to worry about. Another gentleman said, well, I'll, 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 I'll take that. I'll, I'll do your worrying for you for $100,000. Then the gentleman said, well, where's my $100,000? That's when the first man said, well, that's the first thing you have to worry about. Worry has a way of transferring it. And we see it now in the culture. When we listen to the news, when we hear what people are thinking, when we get the statistics, yeah. Uh, that which started off as concern is now causing us to tremble. Now 
that it's affecting more than health, but financial markets and and uh, confining us to premises and uh, limiting our motion and movement and raising questions about supplies of needs and food and all of that, yeah, it can kind of draw you from legitimate concern for which you should act responsible to illegitimate worry. In fact, Jesus even goes a little deeper because he says, if you're controlled by worry, he says, O ye of little faith, in verse 30 of Matthew 6. He didn't say he had no faith. He says it's too small. Many people believe in God who still worry because they have little faith. But now, how do you measure little faith? How do you know? Well, if you're worrying and that's become your pattern, you know you have little faith. And that's because of the size of your God. Uh, some years ago, I was supposed to take a plane to uh, a speaking engagement in Iowa. My wife was supposed to go with me until she found out that I was going to be picked up in a twin engine Cessna to take me there to get me to the engagement on time. She said, I'm sorry, I'm not going with you. I told her, well, you don't have enough faith, she said to me. That's because you don't have enough plane. The schedule got changed and I wind up going by a major airlines. Oh, she said, I'm going with you now. I said, your faith grew. She said, that's because the size of your plane grew. You see, the size of your faith is tied to the size of your God. When you shrink God, you automatically shrink faith. So if you and I have little faith, it's because we're operating with a small, understanding and view of God. So the way you get more faith is not going faith hunting. The way you overcome worry is not by trying to tell yourself and talk yourself into not worrying. It is to expand your understanding view of and submission to God. So the best way I can help you to work through this crisis, help me, help, help those who are in our sphere of influence, is to grow God in your understanding, in your experience, and in your focus. Because when we grow him, your faith will grow with it, and your worry will shrink and become responsible concern. Jesus goes on to say in this passage in Matthew 6, you need to look at Mother Nature who's controlled by Father God. Mother Nature is not a lady who has independent authority. She submitted to Father God. And he says, what you need to do in verse 26 is look at the birds of the air who don't sow or reap or gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He says, look, if you're worried about corona or anything else that's causing you to illegitimately worry rather than be limited to legitimate concern, he says you need to go bird watching because they will teach you how God operates. By the way, he calls them your heavenly father, not the bird's heavenly father. He says they don't sow or reap. They don't go farming. Birds don't have 403Bs. They don't have CDs. They don't have mutual funds. They don't have saving accounts. And yes, they don't have ulcers. Have you ever seen a bird with an ulcer? Because they didn't worry a hole in their belly. And yet he says, your heavenly father, not theirs, your daddy, your daddy takes care of them. So let's picture our friend, the bird. He's standing on a branch, but he's not standing on the branch with his beak open toward heaven, waiting for worms to drop into its mouth. Every day it goes worm hunting because it assumes something. If I'm alive, there's a worm somewhere to be found. So he doesn't alleviate responsibility out of concern to eat. He exercises responsibility knowing that the provision comes from another source. God says, when you're prone to worry, go bird, go bird watching. Because you'll see how the Father operates. He says, and look at the lilies of the field, how well they're clothed, he goes on to say says, the lilies of the field, they don't spin. They don't have sewing machines. 
And yet, they are beautiful because your Heavenly Father provides for them. You know our problem? We believe in a God who we do not understand as a father. We hear it in our prayers. Oh, great father and God, creator of the universe, who spun creation into being simply by the voice and word of his mouth. All of that's true. But you can believe in that God and still keep a transcendent, long distance relationship, not an intimate association as daddy. He says that I want you to look at him as a father when it comes to not worrying. He says, I want you to look at him as a father and understand that this father cares for you. And when you come to look at him this way, understand him this way, and relate to him this way, you begin to experience God the daddy and not just God the creator. I love Isaiah chapter 26, verses three and four. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon me. Jeremiah 17 verses 7 and 8 says that God will keep you calm even in a drought, even in a virus. So I want you to calm down. I want you to look at your family members right now who are seated with you and say, don't worry. The kids who now understanding that they're staying out of school because of this virus, whisper to them now, hey, hey kids, don't worry. Let me tell you about your heavenly father. Yes, your earthly father is limited, but your heavenly daddy is not. This is the time to go daddy hunting. And yeah, we're talking about God, but we're talking about the fathering of God, who is also the great creator of the universe. You know, we've got this exercise where we're supposed to wash our hands 20 seconds, and do it many times during the day. Let me give you a little secret. Use hand washing as prayer time. Just put the soap on your hands, you're washing them, have a conversation. Hey, for, hey, daddy, you told me not to worry. You told me not to worry about the virus. In fact, you told me to be anxious for nothing, you said. So, so right now, I'm not going to worry. I, I know this is a problem out of control, but you're not out of control, and you're my daddy. So as I wash my hands... When you send your kids to wash their hands, teach them to pray. See, this is a great time because uh, Philippians 4 says, when you are tempted to be ang anxious, that's an invitation to pray. So you always know you're supposed to pray because it always should be connected when you're tempted to be a worrier. And if you are going to wash your hands all, all day long, talk to your daddy all day long and get your growing focus on God who is able to calm your fears. Don't misunderstand me. Corona, you ought to be concerned about. We ought to follow the directions that we're given by our government and by our leaders. And we ought to make wise decisions about physical distancing, not social distancing. We want to stay connected, but do the wise things. But be, still be able to sleep at night, still be able to laugh, so be able to love your loved ones. You don't live in panic when you know you have a heavenly father. The problem is we have a world today that has forgotten that God wants to be their daddy, not just a name we throw out. He says, if you will make this shift, there will be a dynamic change in your calmness meter. He says in verse 31, do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? Put it in everyday colloquial language. How are we going to make it? Am I going to get there? How are we going to do it? He says, for these things, the Gentiles, non-Christians, eagerly seek. They get worried about it. They go after it. They're nervous. He says, but your father, hey, we got a daddy thing going on again, already knows you need these things. You know what our problem is today? We have too many people who've never been with a daddy who knows how to be a father. And so you don't, you don't know what it is to look to somebody to cover you in a crisis. But you do have a daddy 
If you're committed to Jesus Christ, you've got a daddy who is more concerned about your welfare than you are. And he says the secret. So I'm going to give you the secret. If you want to get over your worry, if you want to get over, you want to calm down, be concerned responsibly. But I want you to cool it because Jesus demanded it. Stop it. Don't worry. Here's what I want you to do. Verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Let me repeat verse 33. And seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. If you want to calm down and stay calm and keep your family calm and your loved ones calm and your fellow church members calm, then here's what you do. And the key word is first. Did you know there's some things God can't do? You said, but I thought there's nothing God can't do. Oh, yeah, no, that things God can't do. For example, the Bible says by two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. He can't lie. Another thing God can do is he can't be contradictory to his own nature. He is always consistent with himself. God can't sin. So there's some things God can't do. But let me tell you another thing God can't do. He can't be second. The moment you put God in second place, you've removed him from engagement with your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. God must be put in priority, but not just because you say the word, God is first in my life. That's nice religiosity. No, he must be functionally first, not philosophically first. He must be functionally first, not merely verbally first. And how do you know when God is first? Because he takes priority in your decision making. When you have to choose what you will do or won't do, he wins the choice. If he does not win the choice, he's not first, no matter how often you use his name. And what should we be looking at when we put him first? It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, his rule in your life. God's kingdom is his rule. That he gets the final decision over everything that has to do with you. That makes him first. He does not want to be one of many. He has an exclusivity clause here. He wants to be prioritized over the highest priority you have in your life. Because when you have to make a choice, you choose him or his way of doing things. That's why you ought to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. His righteousness is his standard. What is his standard on this issue? What is his standard on my life? What is his standard on my relationships? What is his standard on myself? What is his standard on this thing I want to do? What is his standard? And when I submit to his standard and relate to him as my father, because it's a relationship thing, not just doing it because he says do it, but doing it because he's daddy. He's a relationship. God wants a relationship and he wants a close one, an intimate one with you. He says, when you do this, I got you. And does that mean there won't be challenges? No, because then there would be nothing to pray about. Does that mean there won't be trials? No, because that means there's nothing you have to trust him for. But it says that you will not face those trials by yourself. They actually will become opportunities for you to see daddy do his thing. There's nothing like a child that doesn't have to worry because they know daddy's got it. That daddy has it, not only because he has the power to have it, but because he's my daddy and he loves me. This is a great teaching moment for the loved ones in your life, for your fellow congregants to know that you don't have to worry. If, in fact, after this passage, and you should read these, these verses, Matthew 6, verses 25 uh, to 34, you should read that every day, three times a day. And whenever worry starts bubbling up, you should read it, and then you should pray to be reminded, Daddy got it. 
Daddy's in charge. <laughs> Daddy's on a roll. Kids don't worry. Daddy's moving. No, you want, you want to keep Daddy in front of them. You want to keep Daddy in front of yourself, in front of your loved ones. You want to keep Daddy because when you do, it will become clear Daddy really doesn't know what he's doing. I love how he closes this section. He says, so do not worry, verse 34, about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. For each day has enough trouble of its own. Most people are crucified between two thieves, yesterday and tomorrow. Do you know today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday? Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Uh, so let yesterday go. Trust God for tomorrow. And be at peace with him right now. If he has you here today, believe he's got you today. You plan for tomorrow. But you live by faith today. And when you do. You will see God's spirit allow you to breathe, allow you to sleep, allow you to rest, because you know daddy's got it. Let me tell you a little bit about my life growing up in Baltimore. My father was a stevedore, he was a longshoreman. And the only time he got to work was when ships came in and they had to unload and load boats. So sometimes he would go weeks and sometimes months without being called into work based on what was happening with the loading and unloading of ships. During those times when months went by when he didn't have work, I never stayed up worrying about how I was going to eat. I never stayed up worrying about how the bills were going to be paid. I, I never worried because I knew my daddy. You know what my daddy would do? My daddy would go fishing. Now, folks who know Tony Evans know Tony Evans does not eat fish. I don't eat fish. I eat seafood, but I don't eat fish. Because the way I ate growing up when my father didn't have work, he would go catch herring. Now, herring... That's fish with a billion bones in it, tiny bones. We had herring for breakfast. We had herring for lunch. We had herring for dinner. And then we had herring for dessert. He would catch them by the nets and bring them home. I grew up during those periods of time eating herring for everything. So I don't eat fish anymore. But you know what? I never went hungry. Now, I would prefer fried chicken. Sometimes I had to settle for herring. But I was always fed because I knew my daddy. And my daddy would do whatever it took for me not to worry. Wasn't always what I wanted. Wasn't always what I preferred. But it did meet the need. Yeah, God's not promising you everything is going to be exactly like you wanted and you won't have some inconveniences during times like this. He is saying he loves you enough to be your daddy. And as a daddy, he loves you enough to meet you at your point of need. So, stop it. Quit it. Because he cares for you. And let the peace of God, Philippians 4, that passes all understanding... Guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Relax. Be legitimately concerned. But don't worry. Stop it now. One of the most challenging questions that all of us have faced, many of us have verbalized it, most of us have thought it, 
is to ask God why. Because as far as we are concerned, what we are dealing with does simply not make sense. Sometimes it seems unfair. Sometimes, if the truth be told, you even wonder, does he really care? It is one thing to ask God a question. It's another thing to question God. And as long as you keep that distinction in mind. But the biggest why, as far as humans are concerned, probably the biggest, biggest why is Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But in terms of our own human trouble, the biggest why is Job. Because the whole book is about why. The question is, why? He says in chapter 7, verse 20, why do you make me your target? You're doing target practice on me. The summary question in the book is, why do the righteous suffer? In other words, is it worth it? Being committed, being a Christian, going all in, becoming a disciple, is it, is it worth it? If I'm going to do right and I still got to bear wrong, why? We're told in verse 1, he was a man Full of faith, he feared God and he turned away from evil. He was not only a man of strong faith, he was a man with a solid family. Amen. He talked about, verse 2, his seven sons and his three daughters. I would call him, my phrase would be a kingdom man because when his kids went out to party, verse 5, it says, when the days of feasting had completed, Job would send and consecrate them, raising up early, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job continually did. He was a daddy who covered his family. Amen. So he's a man of strong faith. He was a man of strong family. And this is the one most of us would like. He was a man of great fortune. Verse 3 tells us 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 5,000 yoke of oxen, 5,000 female donkeys, many servants. And he was the greatest of all men in the East. But now in verse 6, there is a turn. As successful as he was, something begins to happen that collapses his world. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth, walking around on it. The theology in those two verses is a beast. You have God calling a meeting of the angelic host called the sons of God. So angels and demons have gathered. Satan is part of the gathering. So we got to rewind to the very first sermon in the series and I've got to read to you Daniel chapter 7 verse 10 so you can understand why all these folks are getting together. Daniel chapter 7 verse 10 puts it in these words. Let me read verse 9. I kept looking until the thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. God. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels 
were a burning fire, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were open. So the gathering in Job is the court scene that is described when the thousands and thousands of angels who are called sons of God in Job are gathered because court is called in session. We have explained to you and me that your relationship with God on earth is a spiritual one, but it is also a legislative one. It is a legal gathering. If you do not grasp the legality of your life on earth by what's happening based on what's happening in heaven, then you will not formally realize what is happening to you. Satan and the angels are called to court because that's the reason for the gathering. There is a grand jury in session. Grand juries assess the evidence to determine what is legitimately to be taken to trial. So the grand jury is called and God asks Satan, where you been, boy? What, what, what's, what, what's, the, what's the caseload today? Now I'm going back. You remember Revelation 12, 7 through 11. He is an accuser of the brethren. The Greek word accuse means to bring legal lawsuit. So Satan wants to bring legal lawsuit against you and he wants to do it for one overriding purpose. Daniel 7 verse 10 says, the book's were open. Psalm 139 verse 16 says that when God made you, he put you in a book. The book is the substance, Psalm 139 16 says, of your life. It's your story as God has desired it and designed it to be. So you have a book. Satan's goal is for you to not realize what's written in your book. In other words, he wants to deny you your destiny. He wants to deny you God's plan, goal for your life. That starts with conception, which is why abortion is wrong, and goes all the way through death in this life, and you have a book. Satan's goal is to keep that book from being realized, to keep your destiny. And he does that by accusing you, that is, bringing up a case against you. When, what have you been doing, devil? He says, I've been walking to and fro. To and fro the earth, verse 7 of Job 1 says, walking around it. And then God does something that we don't like. He helps the devil out. Verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? Have you checked out my servant Job? Because he is the goat. There is no one like him, verse 8, on earth. Blameless, upright, fearing God, turning from evil. Satan said, hmm, Job, Job, hmm. I know about Job because he's the greatest man on earth. So so I know about him. Does Job serve you for nothing? In order for Satan to accuse, he has to have a basis of accusation. He's blameless in all of his actions. But God, I think I got something. Sometimes Job's motives are wrong. You know that he does all the right things, but he doesn't always do all the right things for the right reason. 
Does he serve you for nothing? Or is he like a lot of folk you know, he just serves you for his blessing? I'm coming to get my blessing. I want God to, you know, give me a new car, new house, new clothes, you know. I, I, I challenge Job based on motivation. I can't blame him for his actions because he either doesn't do wrong or he sacrifices when he does do wrong, so he's back in fellowship with me, but I want to get into his mind. Because all of us knows what it is to do the right things with the wrong thoughts. To do the right things with the wrong motivation. To justify our actions because of our thinking. He says, I know what I can do. I can attack Job on the motivational level. But I got a problem, God. Devil says, I, got, I do have a problem with, with this because you brought him up. I didn't bring him up, but since you brought him, up, brought him up, I can deal with him on the motivational level, but I got a problem. Have you, verse 10, not made a hedge around him, his house, and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hand and his possessions have increased in the land. If you, ever, if you ever let me loose and remove the restraining order, then I'm going to show you that Job's motivation is enough to accuse him. Now, there's a whole lot of theology there. Because, one, Satan knows about the restraining order. Two, he can't do anything until God moves it. Okay. So to remind you from one of our other messages, that means that Satan has to get God's permission to be the devil. That he's got to ask God, is it okay to mess with you? And so he says, if you will remove the hedge, if you'll remove this protective shield, then I can show you he ain't all that in a bag of chips. Because I can get him on the motivational level. Put forth your hand, verse 11, and stretch it out, and he will surely curse you and your face. Because mm -hmm. the only reason he's serving you is because of stuff. You didn't give him a good life. You take away the good life, he ain't going to be all that Christian. He ain't going to be loving the Lord. Because he's only doing this to get his blessing. And unfortunately today we live in a folk day when folk want to use God. He's good as long as he's giving me my stuff. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. Satan, God releases the restraining order to a point. Okay, I'm going to let you touch his stuff. I'll say something about that in a moment. But I'm not going to let you touch him. So not only does God control whether the devil does something, he controls how much he allows the devil to do. But notice how much the devil was allowed to do was connected to his relationship with Job. Job is a blameless man. Job's, a, Job's an honorable man. He fears God. So if you don't fear God, if you don't care about the Lord, what you have just done is strengthen and elongated the leash of what Satan is allowed to do. He says, okay, but don't touch him. And then he comes into the worst 24 hours of his life, beginning with verse 13. He loses his kids in a collapse. He loses his business, 14 and 15. Fire comes down and consumes everything, 16. 
band of raiders come in and destroy everything 17. Everything collapses. And it's, it's one thing to have one bad thing today. It's another thing to have everything happening on the same day. This is a massive collapse allowed by God. Please understand me here. The most important doctrine that you can learn as a Christian is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, faith alone in Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. To accept Christ as your personal substitute is the greatest truth you can learn. But the second greatest truth you can learn is the sovereignty of God. Now, this is very important. Because if you don't believe God is sovereign, you live your life by luck. Chance. Happenstance. Fate. No, there's no such thing as luck in the Christian vocabulary. Everything, everything is either caused by God or allowed by God, but nothing is ever missed by God. Verse 20, then Job rose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground and worshiped. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not, this is not, you know, play worship because he's still grieving. Through, watch this, through all this, Job did not sin, verse 22, nor did he blame God. In chapter 2, Job loses his health. Boils break out on his skin. His wife tells him to curse God and die. See, if you're married to the wrong person, that man ain't going to help you. He says in verse 9, do you still hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. I've been wanting to get rid of you a long time anyway. Curse God and die. As you speak as one, verse 10, of the foolish women. Shall I indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? Job does not know anything about this conversation between God and the devil. There are things going up in the spiritual realm that you don't see or feel or touch or taste or hear. That's why you have got to be connected spiritually so that you can handle stuff you don't understand. I love chapter 23. He says in verse 3, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, God, that I might come to his seat. Be verse 8. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he acts on the left, I cannot behold him. And he turns on the right, I cannot see him. Mm, mm. He says, I'm going through all this pain and God is nowhere to be found. It's bad enough my world has collapsed, but I can't find him. Why would God be silent when you need to hear him scream? Why would God be silent when you need to hear him holler? Notice what he says. He says, verse 10, but I know the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Mm. He says, I can't find him, but I know what I'm going to do. I I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to quit. And when he has tried me, I will come forth as pure as gold. He says, the reason God is silent is I'm on trial. Because he said earlier, I want to take my seat. That's, that's, that's a courtroom analogy. He says, when God is silent, I'm on trial. Okay, watch this. Now. When you don't hear from God, 
and you need heaven, and heaven doesn't answer your request, it is because you are now in the crucible of preparation for recovery. You're now, when he goes silent on you, and you are suffering, but you know the way you take, you're going to keep going, you're going to keep the faith, you're going to keep trusting, even though you don't see him, he is putting you on trial so that, he says, when you come forth, you will come pure as gold. So when God puts me, you, and us in the crucible of suffering and you can't find him, it is because there is still something left that he has to do so that he can find himself operating in your life. So he's looking for himself. God will use trouble for you to get a bigger view of him. So he comes to the last chapter, chapter 42. Job has been listening, and God has been blowing his mind. Then Job answered the Lord, after the Lord blows his mind, was how awesome he is, but nowhere does he give him the explanation. I know that you can do all things, and for you to go. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I have discovered you are in charge. Who is this that hides Kant's counsel without knowledge? Who does man think he is that he can outsmart God? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. Ooh, ooh, ooh. My view of God has changed. And the thing that changed it was my trouble brought on by the devil that God okayed. But now my eyes see you. I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Then the Lord, verse 10, restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. Job needed help for him. His world is falling apart. His world had collapsed. But not until he prayed for his friends did the fortune change. So I want to say it and say it again. Minister while you suffer. But the end of verse 10 says something very interesting. The Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Everything doubled. So in closing, look. You got a book. I got a book. We got a book. That book is your destiny. Satan wants to steal your destiny by distracting you from God and trading, making money your God, making power your God, making popularity your God, making notoriety your God. He wants to trade with you because he's going to make something in this world looks more important and more potent and more profitable and better than God and following him. He wants to do the trade. But the one-third of angels that traded with him will be in hell forever. When you trade with the devil, you pay interest payments for eternity or maybe all of history. But God has allowed an appeal process that if you go to God in repentance and appeal your case before him, he can reverse the decision and you can pick up the next chapter in your book. A man one day was on his way to catch the 805 train because he had a destiny to go to. He had a big business deal. And he had to catch the 805 to get to the business deal in time. It had rained hard the night before. And his children, unbeknownst to him, were playing in the mud that was right outside the back door. And they were getting themselves all muddy in the dirt now that had been watered by the rain. He had to catch the 805 because he had a destination to get to. So he rushed out the back door. He tried to leap over where his kids were playing in the mud, but he didn't quite leap far enough and he slipped. 
and he fell in the mud. Now he's dirty now with his kids. And they're in the mud, but he got a problem. Because he got to catch the 805. Because he's got a destination to get to because it's so important he doesn't miss this business deal. So he decides to get up because he remembers that on that train, there is a washroom on that train, there is cloth on that train, there was a shower on that train was what he needed to get cleaned up. So he decided not to hang out with the kids in the mud who were playing in the mud. He decided, I got to do whatever it takes takes to catch the 805 because I got a train to catch because I got a destiny. The old folks would say, a charge to keep I have. A God to glorify. So he says... 